Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, my name's Faith, I am a blonde white woman in my late 20s, I'm wearing a light blue jumper and I have clear glasses on. Um, we're obviously doing audio descriptions for those that are visually impaired to make this more accessible for everyone and our lovely co-host is Misha. Hi, um, so I'm Misha, I'm an East Asian woman with dyed pink and black hair and I'm wearing a grey sweater. Um, we'd like all of our panellists to introduce yourselves and give us a brief overview of your career so far, um, where you trained and what your primary role within stage management is. So if we could start with Alec, please. Um, so I work with um, small scale and site specific opera, a lot of community opera. Um, I trained at Northbrook, which is now Great to Metropolitan Brighton, something like that. Um, and yeah. Great, thank you. Um, John, if you could go next, please. Mm -hmm. Hello, I, I'm John. I'm a yes, John. I'm 5'10", uh, in my mid 30s, a uh, white man wearing a purple t-shirt. Purple, my favourite colour. Um, I trained at Kilter School of Acting um, back when they did professional production skills diploma. Um, and I did a two year course, uh, learning a bit of everything, um, specialising in stage management in my second year, which I then moved on to um, working on fringe production plays and musicals primarily. Uh, and then from working on the musical, stage manager who um, uh, works in opera, so I started um, what we call the park and from that I've just moved to different companies, I've worked at Opera North, um, I've worked at Birmingham Conservatoire for their string opera, I've worked at the Opera House um, from 2016, uh, doing little shows, of shows for little contracts for the past uh, and currently at Royal Academy of Music, and I'm doing my fourth string opera with them. Um, I've also worked at Grange Park, um, we're about to my second season. Um, yeah, interspersed with that, I did that and the odd play, but mainly. Um, John, I think myself and Misha, and I don't know if the audience are having trouble hearing you as well. It started off okay, but it's gone very um, All right. robotic. It might, it might be my headphones, let me change uh, that. Okay. Thank you. So um, can we go to Annette and then possibly go back to John then, please? Sure. Um, Hello. Is that better, yeah? Yeah. Cool. Um, so how far did we, did I get before I started saying robotic? <laughs> um, I think if we just start again, that'd be lovely, because I don't know what it would have been like for the rest of the audience, so I don't want okay. them to miss anything okay um okay so i'm a brunette 510 white man uh, scottish um mid 30s and i'm wearing a purple top which is also my favorite color um i trained at guildford school of acting in 2010 um doing the two-year production skills course where you learn a bit of everything and then specialize in stage management um after i left i was doing fringe productions of plays and musicals um, and then was working with a stage manager who then did opera. Um, so I worked for Opera Holland Park on my first ever opera in 2013. Um, and from there, I've moved on to different opera companies. I worked at Holland Park for four, five seasons. I've also worked at Opera North for four seasons, the Royal Opera House since 2016. Um, Grange Park, I'm going back to do my second season there this year. And Royal Academy, where I am at the moment, um, of music, I'm doing my fourth season here. Lovely, thank you. Um, Annette, can you go next, please? Yeah, sure. So I am a white female with dark brown hair about shoulder length, wearing glasses and a grey jumper. So I didn't actually train in stage management. I started off, I had a proper job working in the NHS and was just volunteering at my local theatre, helping out backstage and things. But just loved work being in the theatre and there and started doing more and more, was working as a casual at the local theatre and such. 
doing stage management on some of the local shows that came in part and doing that part time whilst having holding down the proper job as well. And then one time we had a visiting opera company coming in and they were down in ASM for this particular show. And so they asked the theatre manager if they had anybody locally who could do it. And he put me forward for it. And that was the first time I ever worked on an opera stage management. And so I juggle kind of working in stage management and my other career for several years, really kind of building up the experience and the knowledge and everything until it got to the point, I think it was kind of mid 2007, where I really needed to make the choice one way or the other and decided to give being a stage manager full time a go. I decided it was better to try and possibly fail than to never try at all. So I went for it and have worked pretty much exclusively up until the COVID hit as a stage manager since then. Um, I'm mostly DSM and I'm freelance, so I'm not attached to a particular company, but I work pretty much everywhere John has listening to the list. I was going, yep, yep, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> there we are. It's covered that one for me. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Annette. And um, last but not least, Joe, if you can give a brief intro of your career as well, please. No problem. Hi, I'm Jo, and it's really great to be here today. Um, I'm a white British female. I've got long brown hair, and today I'm wearing a white top. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I've worked in stage management for uh, 30 years. I graduated from the University of Manchester with a degree in drama, and then I had a 10 year freelance career touring and in regional rep with some companies, um, including the Oxford Stage Company. The Welsh National Opera, uh, the Nuffield Theatre Company, Clean Break Theatre Company, English Touring Opera, and the really use, useful group where I stage managed for a year on the UK tour of Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, I've worked primarily in opera at the Royal Opera House for the past 20 years, uh, where I started as a DSM and I'm now stage manager, um, part of a, a team, I should say, of um, 10 stage management. Uh, unfortunately reduced since COVID to eight, but we hope to get back up to speed in due course. Um, so I first got into opera stage management as an ASM with the Welsh National Opera, and I actually knew nothing at all about opera when I started that job. And everything that I learned, I learned there really, to, and that set the foundation for what I've built my opera career on. Um, because I found that the opera, the WNO opera productions, they were on a scale that I'd not previously experienced um, and just the, the, the scale of the, uh, the scale of the show scenically, the vast number of people involved both on and off stage, not to mention um, the elaborate opera plots that all seemed that there was such an endless scope for creativity. It just really uh, in, always inspired me and kept my interest. And, um, and it's this that's kept me coming back to opera time and time again, and of course, the power of the music, because um, I'm always blown away by the singing and the orchestral playing. Um, so I suppose I could describe my entry into opera as a bit of a happy accident, um, but it wasn't entirely accidental. I wouldn't have applied if I hadn't had some interest and experience in music. It wasn't professional, it was only school level music, but I don't think I would have thought of combining that with stage management um, uh, and, and at all until I applied for that job. It was a happy accident that I got the job, I have to say. <laughs> and then I continued um, working freelance um, for, ten, for, for 10 years, as I say, um, and did work in several other genres, um, including Shakespeare, Theatre for Children, Theatre in Prisons, um, and as I already mentioned, the, the, the tour of Jesus Christ Superstar, which I think it was that really, that by that point I was stage managing as a freelancer and that that took me to another level um which was probably the thing that was of most interest to the royal opera house when i got to apply for the dsm role there um that's me i think <laughs> amazing thank you so much cool uh so we a few of you have touched on this a little bit already our next question was basically how did you first get into opera stage management um and then following on from that, what made you stay? So maybe if we, uh, John and Alec, if um, John, you could start talking a bit about um, how you got into stage management or your first um, opera stage management job, perhaps? 
Yes, yeah, so I was um, I was DSM on a production of Jerry Springer the Opera, which is not an opera; it is a musical. I've had this argument many times with people, and the um, stage manager of that was you know, the production manager of that was looking for an ASM for um, the opera season at Holland Park in 2013, and um, she said to me, "She's like, what are you doing over the summer?" And I'm like, "Oh, I've not got anything booked in." She's like, do you want to come play opera with me? And I was like, oh, man, I mean, I mean, I could follow a musical score, but like on a musical spying opera, I've never done opera before. Um, and she's like, oh, it's the same, it's the same, come, come play. I was like, all right, fine. So I had a meeting with the company manager and to make sure I wasn't an idiot. And he was like, yeah, you've got the job. I was like, great. So I did the full season, the first and the last show of the season at Holland Park that year. So my first opera that I did was Cav- Cavalleria Rusticana, and Pagliacci. It's a double bill, two one-act operas. And it was a baptism of fire. It was, I was only ASM and I had to prop the show and the show had a million props and we had a very small budget. Um, And Cav was set in the 1940s, very traditional, whereas Pagliacci was set in the 70s. Um, Again, very traditional for the time, but maybe slightly heightened with the use of colour and uh, floral patterns. Um, so having those two very different contrasting productions within one production, I technically was doing two massive operas. Um, and then the next show of the season was uh, I Gioelli della Madonna, which is a very, not very well performed, often performed opera. And again, massive, massive chorus, massive amount of props. Um, and I think for me, doing that season made me think, because I always thought when I was younger I was going to be a West End Wendy working on West End shows. Um, and that kind of made me go, oh, there's this whole other genre of, of theatre that I've never even thought about before. Um, and it's really interesting because I, when I was younger, I didn't know, I wanted to work in theatre, but I didn't know what I wanted to do, whether I wanted to be an actor, a director, a lighting technician, a designer. I was open to everything. Um, and I kind of fell into stage management to begin with uh, and it was good that the GSA course at that time, I'm not too sure what it's like now but was like all encompassing so you learn a bit of everything um, but even then saying that I didn't think I'd ever do opera um, like I sang when I was younger so I could had a sense of music but um, a bit like what Joe said like I was learning on the job uh, doing the opera that, operas that I was doing um, learning the terminology, learning to read music. Um, I think it was week, it was like week two of rehearsals and the DSM had to get an emergency dentist appointment. So the SM was like, oh, you can go to the book, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. I'm like, oh, okay. And it was a chorus scene which had lots and lots of cues in it. Uh, it's like group one with blah, 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 group two, blah, blah, blah. Um, actually, some of you who have done the BYO course will know that because I give you it's an exercise. Um, so yeah, I just had to cue that blind and like, luckily was able to do it. Um, and over the past, what, eight years now, I've just built up my musicology of, um, opera-ness and, uh, I'm kind of glad my career has progressed that way. Um, cause I say to people, I'm an opera stage manager. Um, and I still, still love going to the theatre. It's one of my favourite pastimes, obviously not been able to do it this year, but um, seeing plays, going to see a musical, people go, oh, you've spent all day in, in rehearsals. How can you go and go off and see a show? And I'm like, well, it's different because opera is my job, but going to see half a sixpence is my, my pastime. Um, yeah. Sorry, I've kind of waffled on. I do that a lot. <laughs> okay, that's fascinating. I think that's really interesting. Um, Alec, if you could share a bit about how you got into upper stage management. Um, so I was very much uh, the same. I I trained in musical theatre as a performer, and then went in when I started studying stage management. Um, the my tutor, where uh, had worked at Glyndebourne, and she said, because I done musical theatre as a performer, I could read a score. She was then like, you should look at working in opera. And then um, 
I did, I applied and did my work placement at the Royal Opera House. And then I was very lucky to get a job on a fringe production of Gotterdammering because of someone I know who I knew who I knew. And then I just got stuck with these lovely site specific um crazy operas that I ended up doing. I did an entire production of the ring cycle for them uh after the goth stammering and I got stuck there and I love I couldn't I c I don't think I could imagine any a better genre to work on. But yeah. Cool. I think that's really inspiring. I think hearing hear all of you talk about what you're doing is just so lovely. Um, Annette and Joe, because you've sort of touched a little bit already upon how you got into stage management, how you got into opera stage management, I was wondering if we could shift the question a little bit to what was it about maybe your first job or one job that made you stay in opera and decide that this is what I really enjoy doing? Um, if we could start with Annette, maybe. Sorry. Yeah, so... I think it was sitting there and, you know, hearing these fabulous musicians and this wonderful orchestra playing and people are paying hundreds of pounds to come and have a ticket to watch this. And I get paid to be there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, you know, the actual power and force of some of the music and such like that can, you know, can be very inspiring and things like that. You know, I don't exclusively do opera as a freelancer I jump about from different genres but you know I keep coming back and doing opera because I really enjoy it whilst I'm there. Yeah I would I would echo exactly that um, that Annette said when I was freelance that's exactly the path I followed I mean to a certain extent as a freelancer you know you have to consider you know what you would like to do against what's available to do um, and a lot of the time opera wasn't available, so I didn't do it. Um, but I always had half an eye on being able to get back to it. And I suppose, you know, that was what inspired me to take the musical theatre job in, in the tour I did of Superstar for a year, because it was closely related. And, and that, that show in particular, it's fully sung through. So it's, it's a bit like an opera in that sense. It's not like an opera in the sense that it's Obviously, it's a musical. It's amplified. It's it's a it's a heavy, heavily rock and roll, really, um, as in its in its um, uh, musical style. Um, but many other things were similar. Um, but I think to go to go back to what what got me into wanting to do opera from the point that I worked at the Welsh National Opera. Well, I was really lucky, really, really lucky. I kind of got taken on as a bit of a project by one of the DSMs um, who was very keen to help me do as well as I could. Um, and and I think that that drew me in very quickly because I, having not gone to drama school, having opted to do a drama degree, the amount of practical um, experience that was available in that course was quite limited. So I'd worked in my own time to get as much experience as I could um, back where I lived in Oxford, um, building up contacts at the Oxford Playhouse, which was always putting on student shows uh, when it wasn't taking shows in or producing its own work. Um, so there were lots of opportunities as a, as a school student, actually, to, to do backstage work. And that's how I got into the whole backstage, um, wanting to work backstage. Like John, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So again, doing the degree, and it gave me some thinking time. And it was in my third year that I worked out what stage management actually was. Um, a director who came to direct the third year show, kind, again, kindly showed me what but it was this thing, stage management, that could possibly encompass all the things that I wanted to do. Um, so that's, that's how broadly I ended up wanting to follow stage management as a career. Um, and so as well as the WNO, um, my, my first professional job um, was actually with Oxford Stage Company on a musical written by Howard Goodall that unfortunately didn't go very far. But when it when we were doing it as a workshop tryout um, was, you know, destined for great things. It was called Days of Hope about the Spanish um, Civil War. 
and uh, with some really great music <laughs> written by Howard Goodall. Um, but yeah, and it, then it went on to do a co uh, to be a co-production with the Hampstead Theatre. I went on tour with it. Um, unfortunately, it didn't go into the West End. Had it gone into the West End, I might have had a different a different trajectory. <laughs> but I think that played a part as well. Working working on that um, early on played a part in me thinking, yeah, okay, let's let's take this opportunity to try and work in opera. But as a, a colleague kindly said to me. Um, or joked with me when I said I was going to apply for the job. You know, you don't know an aria from your armpit. What are you doing? You know, it's like, no, well, they were right. I didn't. But like I say, I've had had really good coaching from one of the one. Well, both of the DSMs actually at WNO, but to one in particular, who really uh, was looked after me and showed me all the things I needed to know about opera, and and actually showed me that although. I could read music. Actually, score reading is different. It's not about reading the music. It's about following the score. And of course, in stage management, it's about doing a million other things at the same time and still being able to pick up the store the score and know where you are and, and cue somebody on whilst you're trying to sort out other things. So um, she was an absolutely brilliant teacher. Um, and and I and I yeah, I got I got some excellent um grounding in all all the as john's referred to all the all the language that you need to know all the all the um the musical uh world that you're walking into um how how um the music is really the focus the priority um and quite a lot of the time even now staging comes as a bit of a secondary or can do um you know it just depends on on the approach of and the working relationship between conductors and directors really um so yes uh, uh, uh it was definitely wno that um inspired me and in fact when i had opportunity to in my freelance career i i left wno simply to not because I didn't like opera anymore, but simply to progress within stage management because I could see, you know, it's such a great company that people weren't going to move on very quickly. And I wanted to gain more experience as a DSM and eventually work my way up to stage manager. Um, so that's why I left. But I did go back as an ASM um, and work with them again from time to time, uh, again, on a, a shorter term basis. Um, and yeah. So like Annette, you know, it's always opera that drew me back because of I think because of always the live music, the power of the live music, as well as as well as everything that you you can get your hands on as a stage manager. Lovely. Thank you so much for your answers. Um, our next question is other than opera, what genres do you enjoy working in and why? So if we could go to Annette first, please. Um, I think for me kind of touching on what we just said in the last question anything with music in i enjoy i don't i wouldn't say that there's any genre that i really detest or wouldn't take a job in if it was offered to me and it was something i particularly wanted to do i wouldn't say oh no it's such and such i'm not doing that but you know i've worked in a wide variety of things panto opera musicals plays site specific stuff things like that and the ones that always stand out to me are the ones that have got the really good music in them. So I think that's what always seems to draw me in, something with good music associated to it. Lovely, thank you. And um, Jo, if you could go next, please. I, th I, would, I would echo what Annette said for me too, personally. Uh, it, it, you know, as, I, as my career developed, it was, it was music that, that always drew me in. Um, whether that was working with something that was, um, in, you know, a, a composer that was working um, with incidental music in a play or or indeed a, a smaller scale musical or or smaller scale opera. Um, definitely it, the, the music has always has always been a draw. Um, I think now I think also the the scale um, of working at the Royal Opera House would would also, if if as and when I work elsewhere again, um, I would, I mean, this is speculative because it isn't about what I've, so much what I've done, but what I would look to. Um, but but the, the scale and the number of people involved, um, the, the technical challenges um, would 
be something that I would be looking for. And again, to go back to what I said about the the tour of Superstar, that that took me to that level at that point um, because I it, it it had some automation um, and some effects and um, flying that I I just hadn't encountered in the scale of of work that I'd done elsewhere. Um, so yeah, those those two things really: technical challenges and and music. Cool. Thank you. And Alec? Sorry, I've, I've, what were we on? What was the question? I've lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Um, it was what genres do you enjoy working in other than opera? Again, again, I think I'm with everyone that I prefer to work with music. It's... Um, so I string off to do many of these, you know, I do these operas and then panto and then the odd musical here and there. And I think that's it. Yeah, I think. Um, but again, it's all the same, same as much. Lovely. Thank you, Alec. And John, same question to you. Um, well, if I can be very controversial, the one genre I tend to avoid if I can, but again, if I'm offered a job, I'm going to take it, um, is plays. I mean, I love going to see plays, but I really find them boring to work on. And I know it's an awful thing to say, but um, like I'd go and see the Cherry Orchard in a heartbeat. But if you asked me to stage manage the Cherry Orchard, I'd probably run for the hills. Um and I think that's, well, I, but then saying that there are, have been productions that use a lot of music and integrate stuff um, into it. Um, but yeah, like I, given the choice, I prefer to stay in opera. I do my pantos, maybe do the odd musical now and again, um, but I try to avoid plays, but that's just a personal, personal thing. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay, so our next question, sorry about the sunlight. Um, the next question is about ballet and dance. This is a question we got from someone um, who submitted it previously, and we are wondering if anyone has had any previous experience in ballet and dance as a genre, either on a show or alongside other stage managers or in a team? Uh, and if so, what similarities have you found between the two genres? For example, in terms of calling the show or in terms of its history and etiquette? Um, I was wondering if we could go to Annette first, perhaps? Yes, I mean, it's a long time since I did a dance show. It's, it'll be, yeah, a long, let's call it a long time. <laughs> I'm not going to try and put it on that one. So I don't know if I can, if I'm perhaps the best person to offer insight on it, but I'd say both worlds are probably more steeped in etiquette than, say, your average play and such would be. And certainly in terms of handling the chorus or a corps de ballet or something like that, there's certainly often more people involved than you would have in a play or in a musical as such. And more roles in terms of kind of in an opera or a dance show, you'd be expected to be queuing people on and such, which you wouldn't necessarily be doing in a play or things like that particularly. I don't know if I have an awful lot, lot more useful insights about dance because it's quite a while since I've done one. So that's, that's completely okay. I'm going to pass the bet on here. Well, I can offer some observation and a, a little bit of experience. I've been predominantly working with the opera company at the Opera House, but um, I, we, I certainly have colleagues who, who are um, part of the ballet stage management team. Um, I would say uh, generally the... The, yes, there, there are historically there's 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 lots of um, etiquette and discipline within ballet dancers uh, training as well, which makes it seems to make them um, incredibly self sufficient um, from a perspective of a stage manager. So as Annette said, you know, in opera you very much be expected to look after the singers, know what they should be doing uh, in terms of their cues to go on and off stage. Um, and I think dancers are used to working in, in a more um, 
as I say, self-sufficient manner um, where they they look after themselves more just because of the, the, the discipline that they've had to observe to, to, to grow their career and to get to where they got to um, through all that training from a very young age um, has in, in encouraged them to work in that way. Um, and uh, of course, technically as well, um, Dance requires generally quite a large, clear, empty space. Um, it isn't to say that it doesn't involve ballets don't involve scenic elements. Of course they do, but but it works in a very different way because especially because you have to do, you have to light the body um, very differently to, in a much more sculptural way. So with the use of a lot of side lights, so you you can't close off the stage with huge amounts of scenery um, because you couldn't you couldn't light them um, effectively, um, and I would say, um, yeah, you're, you're definitely, what is similar is, is looking after large numbers of people. Um, but within that, the groups, the, as individuals, I think the, the dancers are, are very used to also looking after themselves. Um, but you've, of course, you've got the same, you know, uh, issues to cover with safety on stage. Um, I would say um, I've noticed as well that with, uh, the relationship between dancers and conductors is quite interesting in the orchestra because of choreography re requires and the physicality of dance um, is so timing based in the sense that um, the, the dancers really need at certain times the music to speed up or slow down, which in, in opera, um, the adjustment in tempi is much more driven by the conductor's interpretation as well as the singers, but so much more will the singers be required to follow the conductor to keep it all together with the orchestra. Whereas, um, because you obviously have, you, you haven't got anything vocal coming from a dancer, um, it's, it's, it's one musical element rather than two being, being collaborated on. And, and uh, conductors I've noticed do, ne do have to pay close attention to, to dancers needs sometimes. Um, and, uh, one really delightful thing I think about ballet is that um, with the contemporary work that the, the Royal Ballet do, for example, the orchestra get to play the, the most fantastic variety of, of scores, contemporary and contemporary music as well. Whereas in opera, um, it does tend to be uh, a little bit less new composition um, and uh, more a bit more of a traditional rep. Um, so when, when you get the opportunity in opera to work with a living composer, that's pretty remarkable. <laughs> I've always enjoyed that when it's happened. Um, yeah, so I suppose, you know, gen generally, you know, the, as I said, the, the ballet, the ballet requires a very fluid performance space um, and a lot of open space to, to achieve the, uh, the choreography and the amazing leaped jumps and huge amount of chorus, corps de ballet on, on stage. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's, Whereas opera will will tend to create those worlds with with much more scenery. Um, so from a stage manager's point of view, um, in opera you'll you'll be much more required day to day to dedicate to one production in rehearsals. Whereas uh, the dancers can be working you know, simultaneously in different studios um, at the opera house in any case uh, on different productions, and stage management will move between those productions much more fluidly. And um, uh, keeping perhaps the DSM in each of those of those studio spaces, but everybody else moves around a bit. Um, of course, you know, for the as a DSM in ballet, you're you're very much working from a score, um, but but sometimes you can also you can be working from um, something that's pre-recorded as well. You know, if it's a more contemporary piece, it's not necessarily live orchestra. So there's a there's a greater variety there um, in terms of the the, the musical playback. Um, the dancers work with. I think I've probably exhausted <laughs> my my comments, observations, and experience now. If anybody else would like to chip in, if not, I think we move on to the next question. I think. Lovely. Um, so the next question is: um, How would you compare your experience in opera to other? musical based genres like um, musical theatre, pan pantomime um, or gig theatre. Um, Annette, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so as 
we said preview, as we said, kind of with the previous question, there is kind of more etiquette in opera you, than in those genres. And you generally you tend to be working with much larger numbers of people. So you can have a chorus, it could be 20 or 30 people, but it could be anywhere up to 300 people on the most massive production you have. Plus then you've got your orchestra as well on top of that. So there are a lot more people involved. Um, just kind of thinking through in terms of going from rehearsal onwards, the kind of main differences, you know, just in terms of your first initial setting, you've got kind of different people involved. So the music department will always play a much bigger part in opera than they do in any other genre that you might work in. So you've got your conductor or maestro, never make the mistake of calling him an MD as you might do something else. <laughs> never <laughs> Ever. I've done that. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did it once. I never did it again. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all been there. It's not a good look. Um, and they will absolutely have the centre space in the rehearsal room. The director will be off to one side, and you know, just from things like you know, making sure you've got the piano position for where they want it, and that it's been tuned beforehand, and things like that that you don't necessarily have to have thought about as much if you've got an MD who's playing the Kiwis themselves whilst you're rehearsing and such. Um, of course, I can't ever think of an instance where I've had a sound department in an opera. On the odd occasion, you might have a few sound cues or something like that, but you haven't got all the mics and things like that or an actual sound department to consider and such. So if there is anything coming up that you might have to think about sound effects for or something, you need to ask the question of, you know, who's going to be sorting that out because there isn't a department particularly defined to do it. Um, not everybody may necessarily be using the same version of the same score. You know, a lot of opera singers will have bought their own version of Carmen or Tosca or whatever it is and will lovely bring it with them. But that means that their page numbers and everything aren't going to be the same as yours. And when you're noting things like cuts and such in rehearsal notes, it's important not to make the mistake of going, oh, we're cutting on page six, stave three, bar seven, and jumping to page eight or something, because for everybody else, that's going to be something completely different. So it's important to make sure that you're actually using the right musical notation to describe cuts in your rehearsal notes and things like that and everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd say the assistant director plays a lot bigger role in opera than they do anywhere else. I can't think of an instance where I've ever done an opera without an assistant director. And it's not that often, especially on smaller scale, pantos and musical theatre and such, that you have the luxury of getting an assistant director. So they play a lot bigger role, especially in terms of helping, you know, they are the director's right hand and their role is defined working with the director and helping to manage the chorus in the rehearsal room and things, which then frees you up to be noticing where they've all come from, where they need cueing from and what props and costume bits they've picked up. But you are very much there as kind of the technical liaison rather than as an assist to the director as well. So that kind of role is divided up a little bit more in opera rather than it is in other genres particularly. Um, You've got to consider that you've got a full orchestra rather than just a pianist or a small band when you actually get into your rehearse, stage rehearsals and into the shows themselves. And orchestras are very expensive. You know, the cost of paying overtime for one pianist is a lot different to the cost of paying overtime for a whole orchestra. So making sure that you can actually stick to your timings when it comes to stage and orchestra rehearsals and things like that is very much drilled in by management because nobody wants to have to pay that overtime bill because it is quite extensive. Um, we also use slightly, slightly different nomenclature in terms of we talk about stage and pianos and stage and orchestra rehearsals rather than tech rehearsals necessarily. So in musicals and panto, you might have tech sessions one to six or something, whereas we would have stage and piano rehearsals where you're doing technical things with the rehearsal pianist playing along. And then you come to your stage and orchestras, there's kind of a gap, there's kind of that extra step in between having finished a tech session as such and getting into a dress rehearsal, you have a small amount of stage and orchestra rehearsals to get the feel for it with the full orchestra before your dress rehearsal, which again is a bit different to what you tend to get elsewhere. 
Um, and then it's just kind of, you know, you've got the chorus to work with as well. So you'll have, say, a chorus master and all the extra people involved, which I think I probably started with. I'm sure I've missed many things. I'll throw it to other people to <laughs> shout out to them. Lovely. Thank you. Is there anything any of the rest of you would like to add on to that? I think you've actually given a very comprehensive list, Annette. I don't think I have got much to I mean, I think anything I could add is just detail, really. Um, I think you've, you've pretty much covered it all. Um, all I could add is that um, to the, the stage piano, stage orchestra, um, it's, it's when you first start in opera, it's quite, um, it is very different, understanding that it's the stage and piano rehearsals that are really the director's rehearsals. And when you get to the stage and orchestra rehearsals, it's very much the conductor's domain. And depending on the formality of the company that you're working with, the size of the company, etc., it, it, it can be really quite a, a strong demarcation. You know, a, a director would not stop a stage and orchestra rehearsal without a pre-agreement with the conductor. It, it's not there. It's not in their control. Um, and like, likewise, you wouldn't expect a conductor to intervene too heavily in a stage and piano rehearsal, um, though they would attend, um, because that's the time for the director to really work technically. So, um, yeah, it's it's that's something that's quite uh, quite a big thing to get used to, isn't it? When you when you start out in opera. Um, and what I would add to your your comments on on the sound department, Annette, is um, of course you do have to also consider. Um, fold back orchestral fold back for singers on stage so so it's not that there are, are no there are no sound requirements but yeah the sound requirements are really different between musicals and opera um, and of course the other thing that singers will always need is a very good eye line to the conductor which if they can't see the orchestra the, the conductor in the orchestra pit has to be relayed via a monitor um, so and you can find yourself putting monitors in some very weird and wonderful places <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Amazing. So um, the next question um, is about sort of festivals, so specifically an outdoor opera, opera that sort of we're looking to talk about, opera that takes place outside of the traditional venues. Um, so the question is, what differences and challenges have you come across while working in either festival set specific or outdoor opera compared to opera set in a quote unquote traditional theatre? Um, some of you have mentioned that you got experience in that. So maybe if we start with John. Yeah, so um, I worked at Holland Park um, 2013 through to 2016 seasons. And uh, if people don't know where uh, Holland Park is, it's um, just off High Street Kensington. And it's the old Holland house that's pretty much gutted. Um, it got bombed in the war um, and a temporary tent is put up um, with a massive stage. and for well this year they're doing a different configuration because of covid but on an on a usual year um at the time it's the biggest stage in london um it's 22 meters across by i think 10 meters deep maybe eight meters deep um and it's an open stage there's no there are there are wings which are part of the house but it's very open the auditorium is very open um it is canopied, so it's technically not outdoor theatre. It's not like the Beaches Park where you are exposed to all the elements. Um, but with Holland Park, yeah, it's very much, um, if it's windy, it's a wind tunnel. You've got bits of paper on stage being blown to the side. Um, <clears throat> one production I had, uh, Hurricane Lanterns, um, that the director wanted actual candles in. And obviously they were always getting blown out, um, blown out with the wind. Uh, during rehearsals, you'd have wildlife walking into onto the auditorium, into the stage, um, peacocks screaming at the top of their lungs um, throughout the like stage and piano rehearsals. And then after technical rehearsals, the stage management and the creative team would stay behind and do lighting sessions into the morning. Um, well, not more, like very late night, 2, 3 a.m. Um, and you'd hear all the weird and wonderful noises of all the different animals in the park. Um, and because of the canopy as well and the lighting rig, we've got a massive lighting rig with loads of moving lights. Um, it's also a nice place for uh, pigeons to um, nest. Um, so you often get a flutter of a, a pigeon or a dove or what, what other um, flying animals you have. Um, also with 
in the stage left wing of the house is attached to the youth hostel um, and in this in the stage left wing there's a window that can open which is one of the, the female d- dormitories um, and if they're having a rave or something and it's a quiet piece of the, op- of the opera the audience will hear a mm-hmm, 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 as well and then you have me running around and speaking to the management going shut that off get them to be quiet um, but there's also uh, they don't I haven't done it in the past couple of years but for a five year stretch they did um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland um, as a side opera in one of the lawns in Holland Park the Yucca Lawn which is next to the Japanese gardens um, and that was four different stages set round one two yeah four um, set round the field and within the opera it was only about an hour and 10 minutes long and you would get the audience to sit in zone one and watch. Then they'd move to zone two and watch and then turn around and see zone three, then move to zone four and then move back to zone one. Um, but that was an interlude and we had a, a few chorus members who um, would help that move along uh, whilst I was scuttling behind putting setting up the next scene for the next zone. Um, and with that, that is completely open to the elements. So obviously if it's a humid day, uh, the strings might not necessarily want to play out in the open because of expanding and contracting strings. Um, we had in the five years, I did four of, no, I did three of the five years. And in my three years, we did two indoor performances. So we had a, a fallback that if we couldn't do it outside, we'd do it inside in one of the picnic decks. Um, but that would just be a traditional, everybody sits down and then we do the show around them. Um, so stage management would get really involved in that uh, with the crew. And we'd be running about, throwing on a table, making sure that the um, the tea party is set and then pretending to be a flower behind a, an upturned table uh, that's meant to be like a flat. Um, yeah, so and it's um, it's very different to the traditional theatre on back to Holland Park itself stage because there's no, as I said, there's no wing space. So if you're doing a scene change uh, that's live, you have either have to be in costume as a crew member or stage management or get the chorus to do it. And luckily the chorus at uh, Holland Park, are um, they've got a core chorus that they've had for years and years and years and years. So they're used to it. Good. Some of them come in and go, right, what am I moving this year? Um, but there have been instances where I've had to go on stage and do a scene change in a, in a rather unflattering costume. Um, but again, like the, we could be stage management could be in costume in a traditional theatre as well. Um, it's not Holland Park specific. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else that Holland Park throws at you. Um, you've also got the noise from, um, so the park itself doesn't close till about nine o'clock at night. And the the, the, the opera starts 7.30, eight, eight o'clock, depending on the length of it. Um, so you've still got people playing cricket and having picnics and stuff out on the sports lawn, which is at the back of the, towards the back of the auditorium. Um, so it's very interesting, like listening to the overture of, um, bohem, but you're also hearing someone go get the ball or another prosecco, dear, um, and dogs barking as well. So lots of people in Holland Park with dogs, so it's um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting experience, both as an audience member and as stage management. That's incredible. Um, <laughs> Alec, would you like to add anything to that? Um, no. <laughs> That's yeah, fair enough. Um, and that, would you like to add anything? Nah, I think John nailed it. Good job. <laughs> Perfect. Throwing the ball to Joe, just in case. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't have that wealth of experience in anything um, out outdoor, so I haven't anything to contribute. I apologies. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, yep. 
Cool. Lovely. Thank you. So um, the next question is um, what important opera etiquette and traditions are there to be aware of when entering the industry when you first go into opera? Um, I know we touched on this a bit briefly earlier. So um, Alec, is there anything in that question you'd like to add about tradition and etiquette within opera? Oh, he might be having Wi-Fi problems. Um, can we go to Joe, please? Sure. Well, we've um, touched on stage and pianos, haven't we, and stage and orchestra rehearsals, etc. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things you might encounter that are um, alien to other genres. Um, I think the, the when I was at Welsh National Opera, I first encountered the the bow probe which is the opportunity to, in timber, put your set on stage to scale to see to see what it looks like, basically. It is a sort of, you know, it's a, what, it's a scale of one-to-one -one model, if you like. Um, so that I'd certainly never encountered before. And, of course, that, that comes from um, opera tending to share costs between companies, very lot, lots of co-productions being done, um, and also the, the the planning framework that sits with opera, which tends to plan years ahead. Um, certainly at the Opera House, you know, we're we're looking five years ahead all the time. Um, partly because of co-production, partly because of um, singer availability, um, and our and our own and our own rep year to year. Um, and of course, um, speaking of the rep. There is a, a huge tradition of reviving your production. So production might stay, it, it's new and then stays for, well, goodness, I'm trying to think. Some of the Opera House productions have been in the rep for 30 odd years. Um, and, you know, we've only just got the production we're doing currently of La Boheme is very new in, in terms of the history of Boheme at the Opera House, um, uh, as, as is the current production of Tosca, you know, that, that only came in relatively recently. So, um, so yeah, so, so shows coming, coming back and coming back again and um, going out to uh, other countries, other opera houses, um, as, as well as as a co, you know, you might be doing something at the opera house as a co-production with five other companies. So, you know, you have to consider the technical aspect when, when, when the production department are planning that, they have to consider the technical requirements for all the venues, not just the Opera House. So that's quite interesting. Um, also, the, the other uh, rehearsal that you won't encounter anywhere else is the, the Zitz Probe, uh, which is the opportunity for the singers and the orchestra to get together for the first time. So once you've completed, traditionally, once you've completed your, uh, or getting towards the end of um, the rehearsals in the rehearsal room, or probably more likely your stage and piano rehearsals. Before the stage and orchestra rehearsals, you will have the Zitz Probe, um, so, that, so that the singers and the conductor can work musically together on the detail of what they're um, trying to achieve before they have the added elements of, of the staging to consider. Um, the, I, I, I think this is probably true elsewhere, but um, certainly, again, at the Opera House, we, as stage management, we tend to get less, in, a lot less involved in anything that's very specifically music. So if there is a rehearsal that is only music, then it's something that we'll, we'll cast an eye over, but we won't get fully, we really won't get involved with, you know, um, we, we leave people to their own devices, mainly because we've got far too much other stuff to be doing, so, <laughs> <laughs> apart from anything else. Um, the, um, the, yeah, uh, one thing, another thing I was going to mention was that as a deputy stage manager, when you're calling the show, you, uh, you, in any situation, you would never be required to prompt. That is entirely looked after by the music staff and the repetitors. Um, so much so that some productions, again, at the Opera House, some productions still do use a prompt box, that old, old fashioned idea of a prompter sat downstage centre in the middle of the stage underneath um prompting prompting the next line um for for singers we don't we don't do that uh very frequently anymore but it does happen occasionally um but of course um prom prompting in rehearsals is 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 required and that's always done by music staff and sometimes um indeed by the the, the language coach um if 
when opera is performed in, in original language, there will always generally always be a language coach involved. Um, I think, yeah, we've talked so much already about stage, piano, stage and orchestra rehearsals. Um, some, sometimes um, I've, I've had the experience that a conductor won't fully appreciate the technical requirements of a show and decides that they want to rehearse in the wrong order. That's always an mm -hmm. interesting one. <laughs> Um, or forgets that you know jumping between Act One and Two isn't five, a five-minute job; it's actually a thirty-minute interval change. So, needs some pre-planning. Um, it's always interesting working backwards as well. Um, that's generally very confusing for costume changes in particular, um, but that can happen. So, because as, as I think we mentioned, or I mentioned earlier, that, that music is the focus in stage and orchestra rehearsals. So, when the conductor's in charge, these things can crop up. Um, and the only other thing I was going to say was never say break on stage when the chorus are around because um, they will assume it's the tea break and they'll disappear. And <laughs> about how many backstage calls you put out, they won't return until the 15 minutes is up. So be careful with that one. <laughs> Amazing. Um, John, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, no, I think, yeah, Joe's covered that in the net as well. It's, um, yeah. I had someone in my head, but it's completely gone. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sure it'll come back. <laughs> Annette, did you have anything? I know you touched on quite a lot earlier. I think we've covered all of it really so far. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back. So we're just going to get started again. Um, so in the break, we asked you to think really quickly about um, any funny stage management stories you had or so what the most bizarre prop you've had in... Uh, in a job before, um, just as a funny story to try and break the sections up. Uh, so we'll just open it to the floor. Does anybody want to start? Uh, just because this wasn't too planned. <laughs> John, go ahead. Um, so yeah, I was like, scribbling down. Uh, I've actually got quite a lot of prop, uh, prop ones, so I'll keep it brief. Um, my funny stage management story was actually my um, work experience, which was on the King's Speech play that um, went on tour that went into the West End. And the first three weeks of rehearsal, we didn't have the revolve in the rehearsal room. So I was, as the ASM play, placement, the revolve. So I had two uh, wardrobe, uh, what they called, uh, where you hang all the costumes up and it was just me going, I'm now at 35 degrees. I'm now at 90 degrees. Um, so that was fun. Um, bizarre props. Number one, uh, one opera that I did, I had a six foot uh, statue of the Madonna um, of the Virgin Mary, which I had to make bleed from a certain part of her body. Um, so I had to drill holes and put a, a UV drip thing that you could squeeze and then it was horrific. And I've still got the mental image imprinted. Mm -hmm. Um, another one was last year I did a production of Sherpa um, by Massini, which is the next story after the marriage of Figaro. Um, and I had to get this uh, cherub about, about ye big. Um, and I was able to get one from a garden centre for £190, but it also weighed about £190. So <laughs> me, the tech manager and the ASM all trying to hunt a plinth. That was fun. Um, show I'm doing at the moment, I had to have had to make a contraption thing with mirrors and lenses and stuff. And uh, the designer gave me a, a drawing um, and showed it to me. And I just looked and I went, OK, I think I know what you're going on about. So I made this contraption and both her and the director looked at it and just went, oh, my God, that's exactly what we're thinking. I was like, yay, I can still prop. <laughs> um one of my first play shows that I ever did, I had to make, um, we called it the Vomitron. So it was a tube that we had along the stage and then wired into a sofa uh, that the actress would then sit down and she had a tube in her arm uh, that she could then, as she sat down, she'd connect it. I'd be in the wings pumping this thing. And then at the moment she went like that, I would then press the valve and vomit mixture would come out and spurt all over the stage. It was horrific and a massive clear. Um, thank God we only did four performances of that show. Um, and my last weird prop was 
a few years ago at Ram, I had to get bell jars um, to host um, dried flowers in. Um, and I was thinking just small bell jars, you know, no, no dried or big ones. So I had to contact this um, company in Poland who did bell jars like custom made. And I'm like, I need them about twice the size of your normal one. They're like, yeah, we can do that. Went, but I don't have the money to pay twice as much. And they're like, no, it's fine. We'll just charge you what we would charge for the smaller ones. And I was like, thank you so much. Um, yeah, there we go. That's my stories. <laughs> Amazing. That that the one with the, the vomit is, will forever be scarred. I wish I was for them. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Amazing. Um, should we maybe go, Annette, and then Alec and Joe, if that's okay. No stress if you don't have anything planned. We did, we did just throw this one at you. Um. Um, I'd say probably in terms of probably one of the most awkward ones, I was doing a production of um, Balo in Mashua where the main character gets shot towards the end, but he's about five minutes before he actually dies to sing in and there's an opera chorus. And so the director decided that she wanted him to be put to lay on this table with a really gorgeous detailed like altar cloth on it and then for him to bleed out and the blood to trickle down the altar cloth so that he ended up laid in a sea of blood with all of that. So we ended up wigging this kind of blood bag and long plastic tubing with lots of little holes along it so that he could start on it. And then one of the chorus members at the back had to surreptitiously squeeze this bag of blood throughout the opera chorus so that he could bleed out down this cloth. And as each content on it was less and less white and slightly more pink, no matter how much we tried to get that opera cloth clean again. So that was an interesting one. And then I, a few years ago, I was doing a prediction of Rigoletto that was a corpora with Chilean national opera, and it had been done in Chile first. And let's just say the Chileans are a lot less fixated on health and safety than we are, it turns out. <laughs> So these massive crates, because they'd sent, so they sent all the props and everything over from Chile for us. So we thought, excellent. So we opened the handbook and the whole lot was in Spanish, of course. And it occurred to us that we actually wouldn't know what was in these crates at all. So we opened them up and about three or four of these things were all set in different bars. And so they'd sent all the glassware for all of these bars, shipped it from Chile. And we were supposed to have about 800 glass bottles. And I think we had about three intact ones. And the rest was just a sea of glass. And then there was also a few scenes where people were supposed to be taking cocaine and such in this. And they'd sent actual genuinely white Chilean white powder. <laughs> How they got that through customs, I'm never quite certain. <laughs> and that's one way of plugging the gap in your props budget, you know. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, Faith has just sent me the best message ever going, note to self, lots of blood in opera. Uh, so if I guess if anyone wants to take anything from this, maybe it's that. Um, should we um, go to Joe? Do you have anything you want to share? <laughs> well, I, I could add to the sort of traditional opera props that you tend to find recurring, especially in Verdi. Yeah, lots of blood, um, daggers, that kind of thing. And um, uh, keys, fans, letters, all that sort of very traditional opera props, so watch out for that. But actually, when I was trying to think of some funny stories, I realised that most of mine relate to animals on stage. Um, oh, yeah. We, we seem to do rather a lot of that at the Opera House. Um, though my first experience of the most bizarre animal, I think, that, uh, that I've ever had to deal with was actually at the Welsh National Opera, and it was a sheep, and it was in a production of Pelias and Melisande. And, uh, and it was a... it was. It was just a regular old sheep off a hillside somewhere in Wales, and, and it was a, a regular old shepherd with him, or her, rather. And, um, and yeah, so that was interesting. Um, I did a lot of mopping and sweeping in the prompt side wing. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, the shepherd had to be with the sheep because otherwise the sheep would have definitely gone in the orchestra pit So because we were you know, this was a sheep on a rake. So to add to this story, the wardrobe department were charged with, were charged with trying to find something that you could put on the hooves of the sheep to make them less slippery. I think in the end we put condoms on the hooves of the sheep. 
<laughs> anyway, I, could, I don't quite, it was a long time ago. I don't fully remember. But this obviously stood me in good stead because I landed yet another sheep production at the Opera House recently um, with the Exterminating Angel and we had sheep on stage. And I think the funniest moment was actually when I had to say to the director, look, I'm really sorry. There is just no way we're going to be able to get those three sheep on stage in a 45 second scene change it you know when we've also got fire and a revolve and all the chorus or you know a lot of a lot of cast and sorry i'm really sorry and you know i hate saying no to anybody but i had to because it was just it wasn't going to happen um and my and i'll finish with one uh final one from our production of falstaff in Act Three, the whole of the chorus where uh, stag antlers are in, uh, which are made into a, a part of hats, but they're huge, massive antlers, and they all have to line up in the stage right wing before they go on stage. And there's a horse in the other wing, a real live horse, and who's been in the previous scene with Falstaff. And the poor horse, when we first did this, um, got sight of all these stag antlers. And we hadn't thought about this. We hadn't thought this would scare the horse, but the horse was terrified. And of course, did a massive poo right in the middle of the stage. Um, but it didn't really look like a poo. It looked like a great big watery wee. And the director said to me, um, is, the, is the horse going to do that? Is the horse going to do that? Is it going to do a big wee on stage? <laughs> like I said, um, well, the only thing I could think to say was that it wasn't actually a wee. And no, you know, of course not. No. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I think. I mean, <laughs> we're always very careful to have like three handlers with any animal, such as a horse, and they're all standing by with their dustpan and brush, you know, ready to stop anything that happens. But a bit more difficult when it's a, a massive wet poo because the horse is terrified of the stags. In the <laughs> That's hilarious. Anyway, so we in the end, so we had to stack. We had to make sure we stood the chorus well out of sight of the horse. So it, it was all fine in the end. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much, guys, um, for all of your extremely interesting animal related and blood related stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as we said before the break, most of this section will be about skills um, for opera stage management and then career and CV advice and tips you'd give. So the first question is, um, what specialised skills do you think are key to working in opera? And if we can go to Annette first. Um, I mean, a lot of stage management skills are transferable between all the different genres. The obvious one that stands out, especially from a DSM point of view, is the score reading. You know, I DSM most of the time. So that's the one that really stands out as particularly you know you have to not just follow it from follow the words point of view but you know if you get to when you get to the overture and the on track and things like that you have to be able to follow the actual notes and know where you are and be able to keep up with it especially as joe says and the conductor goes let's just go from here for now okay <laughs> so we all love okay thanks <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Other than that, nothing's particularly jumping out at me. Okay, um, so John, do you have anything you think to add that's a specialised skill, you think? Uh, well, I'd just um, echo what Annette said about the score reading. Um, specifically for a DSM, yeah, it's very important, but for the whole stage management team, it's very, very important, I would say, um, just because, obviously, if... Um, someone's off and someone has to jump in um it's being able to just pick up a score and read um whether you're in the wing or you're the dsm or you're the stage manager um being yeah like obviously with the classics like verdi once you've heard verdi once you've heard a million times one time you've heard mozart but then obviously if you're doing a diff a, like a new opera for example um or one that isn't done often um, having that that edge of being able to play, oh right, we're here now, or we're there now, um, and also with the DSM being able to say to people who, if they were like, all right, we're now here to pick up, like, let me know when you want to pick up point, um, and speaking in that language of, oh, we stopped at bar three seven five or figure twelve, um, or oh, we're on page sixty four, uh, second system third bar. 
Um, yeah, so that's just re reiterating what Annette said, basically. Um, the music is, in my opinion, very important for opera stage management, but stage management as a whole, there are a lot of transferable skills in it from the other genres that people may work in. Lovely, thank you. Joe. have you got anything you'd like to add? Well, just to follow on, really, I mean, I was going to add, um, you know, people skills, because, uh, I mean, that's a general requirement, really, for stage management, I know, and, and again, very transferable, but, but because of the number of people you're working with, the great variety of different disciplines within an opera production from from musicians who won't understand stage terminology, but they might be on stage playing from yeah. crew who won't understand necessarily the finer points of opera etiquette, but you need you need them to know certain things, like please don't stand behind a piece of scenery on stage that you're about to move talking like, you know, normal voice, <laughs> you know, please, actually just don't talk, please. <laughs> um, and um, obviously managing the chorus, large numbers of people, and um, dancers, actors, uh, as well as as well as knowing the needs of your principal artists as well. So, um, so I think you know having having that ability to 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 be really flexible um, with with people's skills and just knowing instinctively how to approach people and how to how to address different people in different ways um, without really thinking about it is is important. You yeah, you're dealing with so many different people who are working. Uh, in so many different ways, you know, it's just stage management is, is the glue, isn't it, that sticks everything together. So you've got to be good at all of that. And I would say if you're going to do Wagner, you need some stamina because, you know, it can go on for six hours, can't it? It's, you know, act one can be two hours on its own, you know. So, you know, be careful how many cups of coffee you have before you sit in the corner for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Um, Misha, would you like to ask the next question? Yeah. Um, so, Alec, I hope you feel better. Um, and also, um, there's a lot of talk about score reading. And I think that was a question that came up a couple of times when we always talk about opera is a lot of emerging stage managers are anxious about learning music. So our next question is, what advice would you give to stage managers who don't know how to score read? So if, how did you learn? And if you could share some examples of scores to check out and to preface this, we did ask the panelists a bit earlier on if they had any examples. And so we've been able to type a couple of them down and I'm gonna shoot them in the chat now for anyone who wants to search them up later because they are just in different languages. Um, but if Joe, if you'd like to go first, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I would, first off, I would say, um, don't worry about it because everybody, I believe, can learn to follow a score. And it's about practice, familiarity and uh, building up your confidence. So, as I said earlier, you know, just because I could do I did music at school, it didn't mean I could understand straight away how to follow a score that was in a useful you know, capacity for being a stage manager. I had to learn that. And it's that that anybody can learn. Um, so. Um, to start with, it's about really connecting what you're hearing with what you're seeing on the page. And stage management, um, I haven't I haven't met anybody anybody working in stage management in opera or musicals who doesn't who doesn't work with a piano a piano reduction score or you know you, you don't work with a full score. So it's again it's about um, really listening to um, a recording or uh, whether whether wherever you've got that from a CD or, or the internet or wherever um, and, and being able to pick out um, as you learn a piece of music, as you learn an opera, um, recognising note patterns, being able to identify certain instruments in the orchestra that are playing certain themes. Um, it's good to start if you can with something that you might already if, if, if you're not specifically learning an opera for a job if you're just testing yourself and trying to build up your experience to start with something you might already know so I was having a think about this and Carmen for example you know such famous tunes that's a really good way in to um, to following a score because you'll already be confident that you know what the tune is and and you can apply it to what you're seeing in front of you um, so in terms of the actual musical nitty gritty. Um, uh, when you're when you when you're learning to recognise um, 
sung lines, uh, it's important to understand what the different voice types are. And that's obviously also very helpful for understanding who characters are wh and what they're doing in a scene. So general background information about, about the story of the opera. Um, but in terms of following the music, that will also help you because you can it's it'll be written in in layers um, on the page and, and you can identify that way um, who's who's singing. If you know whether you're looking for a high, high range of notes, a mid range of notes or much lower in um, what's called the bass clef um, for the really low um, baritone or bass voices that, that would be male. Um, Another thing that's important to get a sense of when you're queuing is timings of the music. Some music can just whiz along lickety split, like you know, quite a lot of Puccini. Um, although it's quite an easy inroad to learning to score read, it does move fairly swiftly. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but that's really helpful because you know, if you start with something like that, you can really start to challenge yourself with eventually putting in some cue points and. And, and working out how long you'd need to say stand by blah 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 and then how much time there is then before you say give the cue to go and and also with trying to fit in um, backstage calls as well and anything else that you might be having to do um, so really familiarizing yourself with the tempos um, and um, for more finessing being able to recognize note value and 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 work out straight away or recognize straight away rather whether it's in a, a count of two beats in the bar three beats in the bar or four beats in the bar for example those are the the, the simple time signatures so called um you just have to be able to count actually and and i have to say the ability to count in your head keep that going whilst you're doing all the other things you need to do um to run a show um, I use that far more than than trying to recognise whether something's in a particular key signature or anything fancy like that. You know, I'm I'm just counting. I'm probably annoyingly tapping my foot as I go because that's something I can keep the beat going with, and I can therefore not lose my place quite so easily. Um, and I think as um, I think John said, um, you know, about identifying really clear pickups both for yourself and so that you can help out other team members who might have had to put their score down to do something else and you know haven't picked up the 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 score for five minutes and need to know where they are um so i mean there there are an you know score reading courses at most mo on most of the training courses that are available um, for stage management and technical theater i believe um and i know the stage management association as well also um if they don't know they still do i imagine they probably do in some capacity still run a, a score reading course and possibly other organizations too um, so that the training is out there as well. Um, but if you are a budding opera stage or think you might be a budding opera stage manager and you're still training, then the obvious first call point is to try to get some work experience in an opera company, um, try to get a placement, um, you know, for a number of weeks. And, and there you will definitely get people interested in helping you um, build up these skills. Cool. Um, I think as a really quick, Adam's given us a thumbs up saying the SMA does have a score reading um, course. And um, John, I'm aware, has a queuing to music course, I think, if that's correct, um, as well, which I'm sure he'll be happy to share more details about. Um, Annette and John, do you have, and, and Alec as well, do you have anything else you want to add to that? That was a very comprehensive answer. <laughs> yeah, John? Um, we've got one thing like what Joe said is completely on the money, like really, really correct. And it's also if you are, you do get work experience in an opera company and you may not be completely au fait with music, it's making friends with the music staff um, and having a good relationship with them. Um, if there's a piece of music that you're like, because it's the piano reduction you're working with, obviously the, the music staff have been working to put that together and give a, a fluidity to the rehearsals and like they'll be playing something but then when you move to orchestrals you're like oh well, what's that but saying to them like oh when you're playing this bit what what what's the predominant instrument in the or orchestra so for example trumpets or this is a flute solo um and pinpointing those bits as well um if for example you are putting your score down whilst you go and do five cues or getting something ready to then pick it up again 
if you hear, oh, that's the oboe playing, or oh, quickly, that's page whatever. Um, but yeah, for me in the past, because um, obviously I've just been learning on the job, it's um, making friends with the music staff because they'll always want to discuss music. They love music. Yeah. That's a really good point, John, because there's a massive difference, of course, between hearing the score played on a piano and and hearing it played orchestrally. And of course, if you've done a lot of preparation, listening to a CD and hearing it played orchestrally, you then, you know, you think you know what you're doing. You go in the rehearsal room and you hear it played on the piano. You think, oh, crikey, actually, <laughs> it doesn't sound quite the same. Um, and, and indeed, um, sometimes with some really much more challenging pieces of music, like Act Three of De Rosen Cavalier, which I still don't think I've quite nailed, um, <laughs> has doesn't sound anything like nothing. I mean, you look at the you look at what's written on the page. You think this is just this isn't this is not the same piece of music. And that's say, <laughs> however many times I hear it and look at it, I just think it still isn't. It still doesn't look like it's the same piece of music. So that one, absolutely, the only way to get through that is to count um, yeah. until you until you. You know, maybe if you did it as a year, you know, for a year, <laughs> it would, if you were a better musician than I, clearly, but, um, but yeah, you know, that, that uh, not, not being taken too much by surprise for those differences, um, but that, you know, is, is good. But the great news about most of the opera repertoire is it already exists, so you can do a lot of preparation. Yeah. Yeah, and most of it's out of copyright, so it's not too hard to find a copy of an opera score on the internet and a recording of somebody playing it. So it's not too hard to go out and find a lot of the classics, for want of a better word, your Verdi's and your Mozart's and things like that, just to have a practice and a go. It's not like trying to find a play script of something that was only written five years ago that's still in copyright that's hard to get your hands on. Good point, yeah, very good point. Yeah. That's I mean very... Yeah. Okay, so um, the next question is, um, what has your experiences been like adjusting to working with different languages within opera, um, in whether it's in terms of working with an international cast or calling a show on in rehearsals? Um, if we could start with John, please. Yeah, so um, before I went to drama school, I did a French and Spanish degree. Um, when I still thought, oh, I might go and be a translator. Um, but then theatre took over and I was like, no, nah, definitely in theatre. Um, so when I ended up starting in opera, um, it was kind of putting all my loves together, like organisation, music, languages, ah, amazing. Um, and I've been lucky to do quite a few French operas um, in my varied career. Uh, unfortunately, there's not many Spanish operas out there. I think I can only name one. Um, but because Italian is quite close to French and Spanish being a Romance language, uh, it's quite e not easy because I don't speak a lick of Italian, but like to pick up stuff. So if someone says, oh, we're going back to, and then says the line, I'm like, oh, I think I know where that is. Um, unless like doing Cozy Fan Tutti at the moment where they say the same thing over and over again for about three pages. And you're like, oh, I don't know what part I'm on. Um, <laughs> for about three hours, isn't it? Yeah, for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, draw there, oh, art off, for God's sake. <laughs> um, and also at uni, uni I did um, Russian for um, a couple of years. Um, can't speak a lick of it, but I can still, I'm still able to comprehend the alphabet. So when I have done Russian operas in the past, um, most of, well, most that I've come across, um, actually my first show at the Opera House was a Russian one, Boris Godunov. Boris, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, in the score, it's got the Cyrillic and then it's got the transliteration underneath, but it doesn't have the English lyrics. Um, so it was quite difficult when um, the director would say, oh, we're going back to Slushite Pajalsta or something. And obviously everyone's going, I don't know where that is. And because I could read this relic, I was able to be like, oh, that's figure 47 or whatever. Um, Useful. And, <laughs> and the next stop that I'm doing after this one at Grange Park, um, Ivan the Terrible by Rimsky Korsakov. I can never say his name properly. Um, I got the score a few months ago. And again, it's Cyrillic and transliteration, but no English. Um so that's going to be interesting for the DSM and the ASM. Um, when I'm like sprouting any Russian to them, they're like, what? What are you talking about? 
<laughs> like, okay, we'll just talk in music, we'll talk in music. Um, so for me, as a bit of a language geek, I really enjoy working on operas uh, in different languages. I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of having to do English operas, but that's because I then know what they're saying. Um, but that's just me. I would like to do more more operas in different languages. So, um, yeah, there's still time. Shall we pop to Annette and then if Alex... But Natalie can feel free to jump in as yeah. he, when he wishes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the easiest way, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah, I'd say don't be scared of the language. You know, language essentially is a collection of syllables that we put together in a way that makes sense to us. So you don't necessarily need to understand what the word on the page is saying to be able to call a show to it because you're following mm -hmm. the words and the sound. You know, pre is pre, whether it be a pre in English or a pre in Italian, you know. So if you're following the words as part of following the score, you can follow the sounds and the syllables rather than having to necessarily know what every individual word is to be able to put it together as such. The one exception being when you have it in Russian and there isn't any translation underneath and you've just got the Cyrillic. That's, that's, a, that's a real challenge when you get to that one, not speaking any Russian, <laughs> but... That I'd say, don't be scared of it. Lovely, 100%. thank you. Anyone want to pop anything in? Sorry, was that to me? I just said, if any of you. Oh yeah, want... no, I would yeah. agree. Don't, don't, indeed, don't be scared of it. And again, you know, you, you, you can do um, an amount of preparation with a with a libretto and an English translation alongside um, in advance, just to help you along the way with with you know, kind of key bits of plot and props you might need and that kind of thing so that you can really get your head around what's actually going on in the scene so if um yeah if you're propping a show if you're the asm or whatever and you need and you need to know a bit more about you know what's what's going on in the action for uh to do your job then you know it's it's not impossible to make make that work so you know that's certainly something i've always done is is written in a translation underneath when I've had time to do that degree of preparation. Um, yeah, always worthwhile. And the internet's a great help if you just want to work out what the story is beforehand and things like that. Definitely, Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, draw, draw yourself a bit of a family tree for the more complicated operas. As Verdi does love a backstory. <laughs> that's, um, that's some amazing advice. Um, <laughs> Amazing. So uh, we're just going to switch into our last section for the evening, which is sort of about um, early career advice and about CVs and all that kind of stuff. So our first question is, what do you look for in an early career stage management applicant? And what advice would you give to someone applying for a stage management role in opera? Um, I'm just going to open this to the floor. Um, if anyone wants to jump in. <laughs> um, I'll start. Um... Well, it's like Joe said about earlier about um, getting work experience. Um, if there's the opportunity, obviously, I know COVID at the moment is not the best situation for anyone, but just being able to get, uh, if you're interested in opera, emailing around the opera companies and being like, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm currently um, studying or I'm a new stage manager. I would love to come observe a production, not necessarily have a work experience. Like, so for example, um, if if there's a Tosca on that night, could I come backstage and just observe in the wings? Um, or uh, could that lead on to um, work experience? Also with work experience, that could lead on to a job. Um, if, you've, if you're good, like, good enough and you're showing promise, um, a lot of people will be like, oh, actually, well, we need an ASM for such and such in September or... Um, it's all it's I, I always hate saying this it's about it's not about what you know it's who you know and nine times out of ten that is the truth it's just from working someplace I've ended up working somewhere else um through and through people going oh I need an ASM or I need a DSM um and it's and we're going about like music like don't I don't want anybody thinking well I don't really know music so I shouldn't it's like having that confidence, building up your confidence and um, in it comes with like, there's still times I open a score and I'm like going, I have no idea what any of this is going to sound like because I 
don't I'm not able to I'm not that musically talented that I can open up a book and go oh unless I know it but for example if I open up the Barbara Seville I could probably sing the notes back to you but I've done Barbara Seville three or four times um uh sorry I've kind of gone on a bit of a tangent there um but yeah that is about being getting your name out there and um asking to observe asking if there's any work experience going um you may come do an opera and go nah this is not for me and that's fine um like for example my work experience when I was at drama school was on the King's Speech play and uh on my exit interview with the CSM who was also one of my tutors he was like what uh what have you got out of this and I basically said but I don't ever want to do plays <laughs> <laughs> but at least I had that experience to go no this isn't for me um yeah that's all I have to say I think <laughs> yeah I, th I think um when you're at the point of in, you know investigating whether you want to enter the world of opera if you can do all the, the things that John's just described and and come at a, a placement with with as much um preparation as you can give it you know with as much awareness should I say rather than preparation you know if you you can't you can't pluck experience out of thin air if you haven't yet got it but but if you've got some level of awareness of what what you what the job might entail and and if you don't have that then there's absolutely no shame in asking either you know you really you really can ask too um just just so that you know your your level of interest is is matching your level of expectation of of what you're going to get from it um, and that's a and that's a really good start. But I think as well, don't ever you know dismiss the fact that really a really sound grounding in all the scale the stage you know, sorry in all the transferable skills from stage management. It, the job is essentially being a stage manager. So all the skills that you're learning as a stage manager, however you're learning them on a training course or on a job or however, um, are relevant. So it's it's simply a, a question of applying it in a different environment um so you're you know you're not going to gain gain your first job in in opera if you've if you've not got if you want to work as a stage manager in opera if you have no stage management experience so you've already got half if not three courses of what's required yeah. um it's just the icing on the cake to to gain that additional experience that is is going to get you that first job um as i described myself you know i literally had no opera experience really to speak of um but perhaps the, the the musical ability um stood me instead uh but having said that i don't recall that i was given a school reading test so there was no actual proof that i could read the music so it was just hearsay <laughs> i think so to give that as an example of the fact that you know it's the stage management skills that are of equal um value really lovely um I think we've got about 10 minutes left. So I think we'll try and add in a couple of audience questions. So if everyone can give a nice brief answer to try and get audience questions in. Yep. So go around all of you. Um, so we got a question saying, how long do you spend studying an opera score before the start of rehearsals? And what aspects of it do you want to be prepared for the most? Um, if anyone wants to jump in and answer that with a brief answer. Um, well, I spend it, well, it depends who I'm working for. Um, for example, I'd never done Cozy before. Um, I started rehearsals here, so I didn't actually know the, the music. Um, so I actually didn't spend any time learning the score, which is an awful thing to say. But then... Um, for other companies I've worked for and like at the Opera House, they give you a bit of prep time before rehearsals start. Um, so that's generally two, three days, depending on the production. And it's if it's a revival, it gives you a chance to read the, uh, to read the score, watch the DVD of it last time, um, pinpoint what might change. Um, if it's, for example, it's a revival, but not a revival from the Opera House. Um, and at Opera North as well, like the... Opera North Welsh National and Scottish Opera do a lot of co-pros. So you watch the DVD, but the the set was actually at the Theatre Royal Glasgow, which doesn't fit in Leeds. So it's seeing what will chop and change. Um, 
so yeah um it's usually about two to three days i think i think opera north i got a week one time um which was far too much time in my opinion but <laughs> that's just me <laughs> Yeah, and if you're working on a new production, um, then, you know, depending what the opera is, if, if it's a, a more challenging score, then you might spend a bit more time on it. Or if it's a brand new opera that's just composed, you may not be able to because there are no recordings. So you, you just have to look at the score and go with the rehearsal process. Um, hopefully you've got enough weeks rehearsing to familiarise yourself and, uh, and and you'll know it by the end. Um but if you're if you're working on a, a a new production of a traditional opera, then you know it's it's about looking at the information you've got in advance, getting to know each scene, getting to know. I think I've already mentioned this a few times. Um, getting to know the story and where the props uh, the props that are mentioned in the libretto, what what you might need if you haven't if you haven't been given too much of an indication of what a props list might look like before you start work, um, and yeah. It really just depends on the complexity of the music as to how much time you think you need to give to it. But um, yeah, you know, Lovely. the more experienced you become, the less the less time you'll you'll find you need. Lovely, thank you, Annette and Alec. Do you have anything to add? No, I was going to say often it just depends as to where you're working for as to when you get your scar. Or, you know, there's some instances where you turn up on the first day and get the scar. So it just very much varies as to where you're working as to what prep time you're able to get and especially from a DSM point of view because you're sat in the room listening to it all day every day you don't necessarily need to have spent as long getting used to the music beforehand as people aren't always going to be in the room so a little bit more dropped into it. Amazing. So our last question of the evening and I'm just going to throw this at you and then we'll do some closing notes and then we'll come back with your answers is um, what three words would best describe your job? Uh, and if you want to have a bit of a think about that while we go through some wrapping up things. Um, so thank you everyone for coming to this evening's chance to ask. This is the second last chance to ask in the series. Um, our next event will be chance to ask uh, Olympic stage managers. And that's been rescheduled to a new date, uh, which we'll um, announce right now is May 12th at 6 p.m. And that's a Wednesday. So keep an eye on our social media accounts for um, updated information about that. Um, and I'll put a link in our um, chat right now to um, our social media. So if you want to follow us, we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook group, Facebook page, Facebook chat. We're even on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, we would love to stay in touch. Uh, we do uh, drop in events every twice a week, actually, uh, on Tuesdays and Fridays um, for you to come and connect with other student or early career stage managers and it's a really lovely time we just chat about stage management stuff and sometimes we have games and activities what three words would best describe your job um, if we go Annette, John, Alec and then Joe um, yeah <laughs> Annette I'm still thinking cycle back <laughs> 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 Does it have to be three words together or three separate words? <laughs> Up to you, whatever, <laughs> whatever works. I would say uh, it's fun, it's engaging, um, and re uh, very rewarding. We'll take the very out, rewarding. Um, yeah, the engagement part is like for me, it's you're always thinking and having the music hits another part of your brain, um, which for me is great. Yeah. Let's cycle back. So, Joe. Um, I think my three words are exciting and varied and mm -hmm. enjoyable. <laughs> Lovely. Um, and that? <laughs> I'd say ever changing, um, mm -hmm. entertaining, and challenging. We just want to say a big thank you to all of our panelists for uh, giving up two hours this evening to chat with us about opera. Um, all of us in the SMS, like, we're really appreciative of you giving up your time and it's been a lovely evening hearing from you. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended this evening. We'd love to see your future chance to ask sessions, ask an Olympic stage manager. Um, so keep an eye on our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram for more information about that. Um, and yeah, thank you. Have a lovely evening.